And now we're excited to have Mike Lang from Discovery. And Syra, who is an alum of LBS in 2011, and she'll be in charge of the series from now on. Awesome. So thanks for showing up on a Friday. I uh, feel like a bit of a dinosaur coming here because this building wasn't here uh, when I was there. So this is amazing. It's a great luxury. Um, like Matt said, I graduated in 2011. Uh, and after a few firms, I've been working at Discovery, where I met Mike. Uh, and I'm going to let him do the introduction, but um, this is going to be a fun session. Thank you. So, uh, first of all, I'm shocked anyone is here at 5.15 on a Friday. I mean, when I went to business school, I was long gone from the <laughs> campus or anywhere near that. So it's really nice of you even being here. I appreciate it. Uh, a little bit about my background, a few little comments, and then I'm just going to hand it off to Syrah and to you guys to ask questions, because I think that's probably the most interesting thing. You don't need somebody up speaking with PowerPoint. You get enough of that wire in class, I'm assuming. Uh, I've been in the media business for way too long. Uh, it's kind of shocking when I think about it. When I graduated from business school in 1992, I went to the Walt Disney Company and I worked in a group there, which was like their strategic planning group. It was uh, a very uh, kind of boot camp of Media 101. Incredible group of people were working there, including uh, Meg Whitman, who uh, I worked for for a while, and others. Uh, and it was a great experience for me. Learned a lot about media business and what it meant being in a corporate environment, which we could talk about. Uh, but after seven years there, both the corporate side and the operating side, I got completely sick of it uh, for the first time. It's happened many times in my career. And I, I, I started an internet company. And this was real early, early days of the internet. When I talk early days, there was 2% broadband penetration in the United States at that time, which meant there was like, you watched video and there was like latency and no one knew what was going on. And I had this bright idea of starting an online video company uh, and getting a lot of Hollywood people involved and so forth. So my first big show was a show with Chris Rock. We sent him out to the Super Bowl and everything. I show it to my wife. She looks at me and she goes, you left the Walt Disney Company for this? Are you crazy? <laughs> And we just recently got married, too, so she was probably a little nervous. Uh, so clearly, as usual, way ahead of my time. Uh, company went under, uh, and as a result, I needed a job. So I looked all over, and somehow I got a job at Fox Entertainment, which was at the time owned by News Corporation, uh, which it no longer is. Uh, after a few uh, few days ago, a few months ago. Uh, and I ultimately ran business development and strategy at Fox for uh, eight, nine years. Loved it. Incredible company. Uh, had the opportunity to work for uh, Rupert Murdoch and Peter Chernin, uh, two incredible executives. And I uh, was involved in a lot of things. Uh, I bought MySpace, believe it or not. There used to be a cool thing. Uh, when I bought it, it was really, really cool things. We can talk about that. Uh, I started a thing called Hulu, uh, which ultimately became a really big thing uh, in partnership with others, NBC and Disney. Uh, started a lot of cable channels, uh, did a bunch of movie work, and it was, it was a great experience. Decided I wanted to be a CEO, uh, which was maybe not the best decision of my life, but I enjoyed it. Uh, so I went and became the CEO of Miramax, the film studio. Miramax was owned at the time by Disney. Uh, the Weinsteins were long gone, although still involved in some of the rights of the, of the, of the, of the films. And so then I was the CEO for that for three years working for a private equity firm uh, and can talk a lot about what that experience was like uh, in terms of turning the company around from basically nothing uh, into uh, a full-fledged distribution company. Uh, after that stint, I was completely sick and tired of doing anything uh, related to uh, anyone else but myself. And so I, I started my own consulting firm uh, and hired a few people and did that for five years. Uh, my, my major client there was Universal Music Group, in which uh, I worked with the, the uh, CEO, Sir Lucian Grange, uh, on the entire music strategy there, which included, uh, music digital strategy, which included Spotify, Apple, Amazon, and a lot of other fun experiences in the music business, uh, and really had no intention of, of going back into the corporate environment, to be honest with you. And one day, uh, David Zasloff, who was the CEO of Discovery, who was my counterpart on the Hulu deal, reached out to me and said, listen, I got a crazy idea for you. Would you ever be interested in moving to London? Uh, I, I lived in LA. I'm sorry, I didn't say that, my family. Uh, and uh, 
you know, would you ever want to do it? I have no idea what you're going to do, but it'd be fun, and, and why don't you do it? And I said, I doubt my wife will ever, we've been married 20 years, I'm like, I doubt we're going to move. We live in an area called Manhattan Beach, California. I don't know if anyone's been there. It's, it's on the beach, and it's really nice, and I love that. I love London, but come on, I mean, no way. So I talked to my wife, and she goes, let's do it right away. She was like, no, no hesitation. So uh, the family, our three kids, myself and our golden retriever, picked ourselves up, <laughs> and we moved to St. John's Wood, and, uh, and I started working at Discovery uh, three years ago. And it's been a great run, and beyond being this incredible uh, executive, uh, you know, I've, I've ran our Nordic business, which is our second largest operating business in the company. We bought a bunch of broadcast channels up there. Uh, I ran our digital businesses, which included Eurosport Digital, Motor Trend, uh, launched a Discovery Kids app in Asia. Uh, I'm on the board of Formula E, which is the electric vehicle racing circuit, which is a competitor to Formula One. It's very small. And we did a joint venture with uh, ProSieben in Germany, a Hulu-like joint venture with them that's launched that I'm, that I'm still on the board there, as well as some other things. So we could talk about all those, those kinds of things as well. But that, that's, in a nutshell, my you know, career, which has been, I feel very, very old now, given it's 20, 20 some years since I graduated from business school. Uh, so just a couple high-level comments, and then I'll just hand it off to you guys, because I'm pretty casual. I know Kevin Swint's probably very, like, I've known Kevin for 15 years, I know. He's a great guy. So I will uh, just make a few comments. Number one is, is that right now, anyone who is interested in the media business, there probably could not be a better time or a worse time to want to be in the media business. Uh, I mean, there is change taking place beyond anything that's ever happened in our industry before. Uh, you know, probably the closest thing was you know, the invention of television. Uh, but even there, it was, it was still a time period that allowed the traditional media companies to kind of adapt and try to figure out what they were and survive, right? Here, the change is so rapid that's taking place that, that, that as a result, the changes that traditional media are dealing with are immense. And they're really driven by two major factors. One, and most importantly, is consumer demand and what consumers want and demand, uh, both, not, not just the younger demographic, but older demographic. Now, I have two twin-year-old, 14-year-old girls. And when, when I was coming out of business school, the big thing was to go maybe work at MTV, that MTV was the future. It's going to be this great thing. They're going to change it to digital. I give my daughters the remote control for our skybox. I said, listen, I'll pay you 1,000 pounds right now to find MTV on one click on this. They'd hand the thing back to me and say, what the hell are you talking about? MTV, I have no idea what that is. Okay? I hand them this thing and I ask them to go find their favorite YouTube star. In two seconds, they'll find it. Okay? That transformation that's taking place is, is mammoth. There's a mammoth shift in terms of how consumers are demanding content, how they want it, when they want it, and, how they, and what kinds of content they're looking for. That is not going away. In fact, it's going to get worse. Because right now, you know, many of us in the media company are holding on to these old folks like me that maybe haven't really made the shift. You know, the most valuable media property in the world today is Fox News. Uh, no matter what you think about political or whatever, it is by far the most valuable property in the world. Does anyone know what the average age of the Fox News uh, viewer is? 65 years old, okay? So, so, so yeah, that world is now and everyone's holding on but the future is this giant wave you know i have to pay my son who's 10 to watch sports right <laughs> he'll, he'll watch esports but he won't watch traditional sports anymore it's not like when he turns 25 suddenly he's going to become a football fan and want to watch a full full game right there's a monumental shift that's happening that's number one number two the monetization and the way that these businesses were built is changing dramatically. Like I remember, uh, there used to be this great business in the movie business called the DVD, where you would literally go to the store and you would buy something, and it was it was in a package, and it cost like US dollars, about $20, and you probably watched the thing once, right? And then you had this really big thing, I don't know many of you ever saw it, it was a, like a big little library stand that you would put it in, and there would be a lot of dust on it, so you'd have to you know, make sure you dusted it off so it didn't look stupid or anything. But it was like, this is my library. 
how proud I am. These are the movies I've watched. By the way, I own these movies, right? It was an incredible business model. That is gone forever. Bye-bye. You can get any film whenever you want on demand, right? For a lot less than $20. And you can, you can do whatever you want on subscription and see anything whenever you want, right? And so that model has completely blown up the movie business as we know. The other thing is, for any of us old people here, you used to go on these things called dates where you would take your girlfriend to a movie and it was like a big thing and you'd sit there and maybe it was like a really cool old, you know, adult oriented movie. Now you got every show you ever wanted on, you know, here at Sky, HBO, Netflix, Amazon, whatever else. Why in the world would you ever have to be at a movie theater at 6.45 to, you know, no matter how long the credits are there or the, the previous, to go catch that movie? That world is over. Well, the economics of the movie business are completely driven about how many people go to the box office, still to this day. Still to this day. So the way that Sky pays for a movie is based on how many people actually went to the box office for that film. That's how they calculate it. So the monetization, I'm using this example, the monetization models no longer fit the changes that have happened to the, to the industry itself. And so the industry is trying to figure that out. Okay. Another great example of monetization is the business that we're in right now, the, the cable network business, okay? Uh, does anyone in this room know about ESPN and how much ESPN gets paid in the United States? So ESPN is the second most valuable cable, well, maybe the third, we're probably number two, the, the third most valuable cable network brand in the world. And every consumer that signs up for their cable or satellite in the United States, that's 100 million people, roughly 100 million homes, pays $4.25 per month out of their bill that goes directly to the Walt Disney Company and ESPN. 100 million, $4.25. Don't have to be great at math, but that's a pretty good business. Recurring. And then, oh, by the way, and you can keep all the advertising revenue of ESPN. Maybe a little bit we get occasionally, but you can keep 100% of whatever advertising. Okay. Does anyone know, with the exception of Monday Night Football, how many people on average watch ESPN? About 700,000 people. Maybe a million on a good day. So they're getting paid $4.25 for 100 million people, but only about 700,000 to a million actually watch the channel, with the exception of Monday Night Football, where maybe you'll get up to 7 or 8 million for that one. one day. And so... As a result, that was a great business model. Well, guess what? It is changing and it's breaking up and so forth. So these are examples from a monetization standpoint, the challenges they're on. <clears throat> Number three is, uh, and probably the biggest challenge to the industry, is the kinds of people that are in the industry, right? So you'll, 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 you'll sit around in businesses and have discussions about digital for hours, hours. And you'll sit around and you'll look around the room and you'll ask somebody, hey, by the way, how many people in this room have an engineering degree, computer engineering degree? Well, good, that's good. But how many people in the media? Nobody. No one will work. Computer engineering, mom, no, what are you talking about? You have the same discussion at Facebook, Amazon, Google, or Netflix, and probably 70% will raise their hand that have computer engineering backgrounds. Okay? So the industry itself is in a very challenging situation because you've got these first two issues that they're trying to deal with, but then you don't have the right people to be able to help you adapt and change in a way to be able to compete in that environment. Okay? And so that is the fundamental challenge. And then just time and the fact that your competitors now have uh, you know, market caps of above 500 billion to a trillion, uh, that makes it a little tougher too. So all of that together is the challenge. But here's the opportunity. And this is why I think it's still, for those that are interested in media, if you define it in a broader way, is why it's so exciting. People love it. It's what people care about. Okay? That and healthcare probably, and, and making sure they're, they're healthy. But when it comes to great content, music, sports, <coughs> drama, entertainment, it's part of people's lives. It's a fabric of their lives that has not gone away. Maybe the kinds of content are changing in some ways, but in, in reality, it's still there and it's still important. Okay? Maybe, maybe over time it's adapting in terms of how it's distributed, how it's uh, produced, how long it is. 
you know, what, what it is, but it's still an important part of it. So being in that industry is important. Number two, in your life, okay, you're going to have a lot of choices of things you're going to be able to do. I promise you, when you go tell people you work in the media business, they'll like you more because you're interesting. <laughs> There's someone fun to be around, right? You know, oh, that's interesting. I'd love to talk to you about it. I can't tell you how many people want to talk to me once I tell them what my business is. You know, over at the American School, we got a lot of great families, a lot of people with different backgrounds. You know, somebody who's a, no offense, you know, a hedge fund person, they say, hey, hedge fund, yeah, that's great. Hey, I'm in the media business. Really? Who do you work for? What are you doing? What did you involved in it? Oh, people like that. If you're the kind of person that likes that, likes to be involved in something that's interesting, and, and it's a great business to be in because people will be interested in it. And in life, sometimes those things are important to people, right? Probably more important than I thought they were to me, but, but they're important and, and it's fun, you know? If you could care less about that, media is probably not the place for you, right? Because it, it is part of the allure of doing that. I mean, part of the allure of my job, for instance, was I was able to spend two weeks in Pyeongchang working on the Winter Olympics. That was fun. I mean, that's a, like a once in a lifetime experience. So you shouldn't underestimate that as you're thinking about one of the reasons why you'd want to be in that, okay? And the, and the third uh, is that it's incredibly relevant in that regard. It's something that people are really interested in. You know, you pick up the newspaper or you look online at the, and you know, Netflix is a big story. Amazon's a big story. What's happening here? What's happening with Sky? What's happening? It's a, it's a relevant story. So if you're interested in that, you shouldn't underestimate that as a reason to want to be in the industry. Because in the, at the end of the day, yes, financial and career is important, but also those kinds of connections are important as well. And <coughs> you like rapid change, because God knows there's going to be a lot of it in our business in the next, you know, some person 20 years from now is going to be coming up here and it's going to be a completely different story. Okay? So a few little recommendations and then I'll hand it off uh, for, uh, for some Q&A. Okay? The first thing is if you are interested in the media business, it goes back to this previous comment, get digital experience. You know, it, it, you know, whatever it may be, focus your, on that. I, I, can't, I can't recommend that more to you. Okay, that that is going to be the relevant experience, the relative backgrounds that people are going to look at. You know, when you wanted to be in the television business, there was always this big debate. Do you go on the creative side or do you go work in the business side? Or same on the film side, right, as to what you wanted to do. Now I think that's the wrong question. I think the question is any way you can get into the more digital technology base of the either content, distribution, marketing, ad sales, whatever it may be, but get in that area because that is the most relevant area as part of the business, okay? Number two, and I, you know, uh, look back on my career, you, you, you do this as you go back and you say, well, what are the things you could have done differently? So it's really interesting. I went to a, a also a pretty prestigious school, Harvard Business School, and when I, I went... I my wrong crowd. <laughs> no, I said and another. It's both the great schools. <laughs> and, uh, it would have been a lot more fun and better. Uh, there were two words, I graduated in 1992, so I'm an old person now. There were two words that were never uttered in the two years that I was at the Harvard Business School, from 1990 to 1992. Number one word was China. Number word, not two words, was the internet. Those two words were never uttered in those two years, okay? So what are those two words going to be for you? That's what you got to think about. Because some smart people from my class had the wherewithal to see and adapt very quickly and got involved. There's a couple guys that started at Amazon when it was really early days, okay? And they, they were able to see that and they looked ahead and they said, well, you know, that's a place, I'm going to go do that. There are a couple people I know that really early days invested time, energy in their life in China, way ahead of the curve. When everyone said, when everyone was still talking about Japan Inc., that's what we were talking about, right? And so, again, what are those two words? What are the two areas that you can see, not today, but over the next five years, three years when you leave here, that you can, uh, can do that? In order to do that, too, you got to be able to take risks. And that was the one thing that in my career I just never really – I did once, and I failed miserably, and once I failed in that Internet startup, I gave up. And I was like, I can't do it again. And, you know, life changes. You have family and, and so forth. And so you've got to be willing to maybe jump and take a risk, but especially at your, your 
point in your career, now's the time to do those kinds of things. Because it gets tougher and tougher, my point, as you get older and you have family and mortgages and things like that, it, it just becomes more challenging. And, less, and it's not a unilateral decision, too, because you're married and so forth. So, so I think that, that that's another thing, is, is be willing to take those risks. Even if they don't work out, there's learning from it, okay? And then the final thing, and I've been very fortunate about this, is the most important decisions in your career are usually not about where you go work or your title. Now, my problem coming from Harvard Business School, those were the two things I was focused on the most. The most important thing is who are you working for? Is that a good person? Is it somebody who really, really cares about me and my career and my development and where I'm going to grow? And number three, are they a high flyer? Are they someone in the company that is a rock star? Because if they're a rock star and they are the first two things I just said, then they're going to bring you for the ride. They're going to bring you along. Now, if they're a rock star and they're not a good person or they don't care about my development, then they may not be the right person to go work for because they probably won't bring you on the ride. They'll be like, hey, thank you very much. I really appreciate all the work. I'm going to go find another person to go do it now for me. Okay, so that's the decision. Like, focus on the people and the individuals. And I know that's tough when you're interviewing, but in today's world, there's so much information. There's so many people you can talk to. You can get references and so forth that that's more important than what's the company name and what's the title associated with it. Those would be the only three things I would recommend. So I think that's enough as an overview. So I'll kick it off and then we'll pass it. To and person. please, you know, listen, I'll just say one thing. When I was running the Nordics, they, they asked me one day to go up and give a, to a town hall up in Finland. Has anyone ever been here? Is there someone here from Finland? Are you from Finland? No, but I've been there. So I had to go up there and give a town hall team in Finland, and the guy, the guy who was at the time running it said, hey, listen, when you go up there, I just got to warn you, no one is going to ask you any questions. If they don't like questions, <laughs> they're going to be very, like, put off by you and your, your American style and everything. So, so whatever you do, just don't take offense. I'm like, they're going to ask a question. I'm sorry. So we finished my little thing, and I sit there, and I said, any questions? And it literally is dead silent <laughs> for, like, 10 minutes, and it's like a stare down. I'm staring him down, waiting for a question. And they know then, seriously, and the guy keeps saying, Christian keeps saying, well, he's serious. He's not going to do anything until this question. So finally, after 10 minutes, way in the back, some guy raises his hand. I'm like, you, excellent. What is your question? Can we get wireless in the building, please? <laughs> so I will take any question whatsoever, but there are going to have to be some questions. All right? I'll kick it off. Um, you talked about hiring people. What is the one thing or the couple of things you look for when you're hiring yeah. people who are relatively early in their career and the opposite side of that as well? What are some of the things that you see and you're like, no way? Well, I think the first thing, and it's pretty simple, is just energy, right? Is someone really interested? I mean, I've got a lot of energy. But, but I mean, is it somebody who's really interested, seems engaged, and seems uh, ready to, to work, right? Their amount of understanding, knowledge of the business or the industry is actually less relevant in those discussions. And the more that somebody tries to kind of prove that they're knowledgeable, it's really tough. It's really tough. It's like, it's like uh, you know, uh, and again, I'm not comparing myself to that. It's like somebody like, who wants to be a basketball player going to LeBron James and saying, hey, you want to go play one-on-one. -on -one? you're going to lose, right? So anything you tell me about media or tech, I'll probably know more about it. It's only because I've been doing this for 20-some years, right? So your best strategy is not to go in there and try to feel like you're the smartest person in the room. Your, smart, your thing is, hey, listen, I want to learn. I want to work hard. These are my analytical skills. These are what I like to do in business. This is what I like, creativity. But my biggest thing is just to learn and to work incredibly hard. That's what you're looking for for someone coming out of business school. You know, also, uh, even though you may have it, and God knows I've had it manage this, is you've got to kind of almost suppress your ego in the, in the interview. You know what I'm saying? You don't want to come across as you've got a big ego and you, you want to be CEO of the company three years from now. It may be your goal, and that's great, but you don't want that to come across in the interview because I think some people may be put off by that and say, well, wait a second, you know, no. You, you're looking for somebody who's going to come in and work really hard and learn and be loyal and 
and, and basically develop from that. And again, it goes back to what you're expecting from that person then in terms of what they're going to get in return. Uh, and then the only other thing I'd say is if there was something that you wanted to prove and show, it, it's proving your knowledge of digital technology, trends, things like that, that you're aware of that. E you know, bringing that across, uh, even though it may not even be relevant to the specific company. Like, so for instance, I'll give you an example. Like if you were having a conversation with uh, Amazon for a job in their sports group, right? It would be good to really know about Perform and what they're doing and 11 Sports and what's happening there and all these other companies. Not to try to sound smart, but if it comes up as part of the conversation to give a context of what's working, what's not working in, in, in the sports space around digital. Any questions regarding the initial career course? Yeah. Um, What's your name? Akila Press. Nice and I'm actually Where are you from? From New York. <coughs> um, here on exchange just for the fall, so I actually go to Columbia oh, cool. um, in New York. So the question is kind of geared towards that. Um, you mentioned that whatever you should do is really to just gain that digital experience yeah. at this point. For me, um, having more of a background consulting as well as like marketing within media yeah. and trying to move towards more like content acquisitions or distributions, things that you mentioned, what are some things that you would assume or like suggest that we do or me personally do um, within these next few months to really gear myself up to not only um, not only be seen as a media marketer? Right. Very tough right. to do that here. You know what I'm saying? There's not no one's going to look at a class and say, "Oh, well, you're really good at content acquisition now because you took a content acquisition school, business school." No, no offense, but they're not going to look at that and, and do that. I, I think there's a little bit of a hall pass. I'll use, I'm using a lot of U.S. terms. I thought a little bit of a hall pass for you because that's why you went to business school is to expand your career and to think about different things. So. So I, I don't know whether they'll be held against you, per se, if you don't have that specific experience. Coming out of business school is your one chance to kind of be like this and to say, I want to go do something different, right? And so, so I, I don't know whether that's, that's as critical. I think, again, the best way to understand, like, for instance, what's happening in the content acquisition world, if that's an area that you're interested in, is to just read a lot of what the current events are of that particular area within the digital space because there's an enormous amount of activity going on. I mean, Netflix alone is spending $8 billion. It's a lot of money in capital for content. I mean, so there's a lot of things that you could do on that. But I wouldn't be too worried about it. I think the bigger question is, for you, is, is, is do you really want to be that specific going into it? Because you may try to be so specific that you limit your opportunity of something big, right? So for instance, if somebody came to you and said, uh, listen, we're looking for a job to do something at uh, Bird. Do you know what Bird is? The, the scooter. scooter company. Yeah, it's not digital media. It's digital technology. And by the way, it could be really interesting. So don't don't limit yourself so narrowly cast because you, know, you might surprise yourself and you end up getting into something that's really interesting that you didn't think about, but then becomes part of your career. And, and worst case, if you don't like it, you can always then redirect. God knows I've had more jobs than anybody, so it's not like you're wedded to the same thing. Hi. What's your name? Yannis. Where are you from? I'm from Greece. Ah, uh, great. I am uh, doing my MBA at Berkeley, so I'm here on exchange as well. Excellent. <laughs> Berkeley. The next question is from Nottie. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my wife's a Bruin. Okay. And we beat you 34 to 7 last weekend. Only time UCLA's won this year in football. <laughs> um, I actually have two questions. So you mentioned uh, China uh, before in, the, in your speech. Um, I'm just wondering what's your take on this big media uh, internet companies from China like ByteDance, um, Tencent Music was recently in the news. Yep. Uh, what's your take on their growth, and how do you think they're going to change the digital media ecosystem globally? Yeah, I think I think the jury is still out on their ability to expand outside of China in their core businesses. I think though China is such a huge market opportunity, and they have such a competitive advantage relative to others coming in there that it that it may not really matter at the end of the day, right? I mean, the Chinese market is big enough that. And, and there's so much emerging demand that it's, it's amazing. I mean, I'll just give you a completely different analogy. So 
one of the benefits of why we came to London, our family, was to travel. Our family has done an enormous amount of travel. And we spent last fall, it's a fall break, in Switzerland. And we were in this town, Grindelwald, which is like right at the base of the Jungfrau mountain, right? We're sitting there having dinner, and this group comes in of 250 Chinese tourists to the Jungfrau region, come right on in in the middle of October, and they all checked in. I mean, there's an emerging, and, and this, these aren't like, these are middle to upper middle class, obviously. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to judge, but it wasn't like the, the wealthy, the higher, higher end. There's an emerging middle to upper middle class in China in the hundreds of millions that could be more than enough for you to build your businesses and still be incredibly valuable companies. I think those companies then expanding into other markets, in particular the US, will be challenging in some cases. Put aside the whole geopolitical situation right now. It's just a knowledge base of understanding of how to be able to build and to do businesses in the US for the same reason the US would be challenged coming into China, right? I think maybe other markets, uh, emerging markets, clearly other Asian emerging markets could be different. But I think the jury's still out on their ability to do that. Uh, and it's not as if, given, again, not to get too geopolitical, it is, is really challenging to do media business in China. There are constraints put on companies. It is not a free market, and it's not clear it will ever be a free market, let alone the ability to pull capital out of those businesses. So as a result, no one wants to do favors to those Chinese companies coming into their market. Now, it's not as like anybody says, oh, well, go ahead. You know, we, we'll let you know, Tencent come on in and compete and do whatever they want against Google in the United States. It's, it's going to be very challenging just from a regulatory standpoint, I think because of that, Un unless there's a change, which, you know, in our, in our lifetime, maybe there will be on both sides to do that. So I, I would suggest from my perspective that, that it's mostly around China, Asia, emerging markets. Thank you. And the second question is about uh, London uh, versus uh, Los Angeles when it comes to media careers. Yeah. Most of the strategy comes from California and people. I don't know about that, but yeah, guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no. New York, too. I mean, well, New, York yeah. and L New York and L. U.S. headquarters, I guess. Yeah. Right, Maybe that's U.S. Yeah. headquarters. But when it comes to enter media entertainment, the headquarters are mostly in Los Angeles. So right. do you think that for someone who uh, is interested in this industry, would it be? Would their odds be better if they started off in a smaller market and try to establish a, pres a presence here, and then maybe move out there? Or well, I think I think percent? I mean again, not to dis but I think your decision process should be instead of London versus New York and LA, it's London versus the Valley, Seattle. Okay. I mean, I think that's really the di dimension that you should be thinking about, because again, I mean, again, I work in the media business, so I have my own opinion. Okay. You know, if you really want to understand what's media is, is like Netflix is going to spend eight billion dollars. You know, Amazon's going to spend four billion dollars in content. Facebook will spend an enormous amount of money. Google is already it, it is shifting the dollars and the and the value. It doesn't mean that media is going away, but there's going to be massive consolidation taking place within the traditional media business with the Fox deal being the first of many more to come. And so you don't want to get even caught up in where that may play out, right? So now going to your question of London, you know, uh, I think, interesting enough, London is more of an international hub. If you have a global view, that London would be a better platform. So if you had a vision, say, I want to go build a digital media company ultimately in, in Greece, then clearly London would be a lot better place to do that. I think if you're talking about generally, though, where many of the scaled opportunities that are built in digital media, and media, most of them are in the US, that could change. There's only been really one example of one that I can think of that's been able to build a worldwide platform, and that's Spotify. I mean, every, everyone else, I think, are very, they've done well, but are very fragmented to their particular markets or in the case of traditional media, are clearly defined by the fragmentation of their markets, with a few exceptions. So I, I would suggest it's more in that vein as to where you want to think of it. We're probably, again, I would say, maybe going to the US first, and then eventually coming back here once you've developed this 
capabilities and skill set to build whatever it might be you want to build. Thank you. Okay, what's your name? Hi, I'm Bree. I worked in entertainment in Los Angeles before. Oh, for who? Uh, Disney and Sundance Film Festival. Great, yes. Um, well, no, no, very well. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say Disney, obviously. So I first kind of going off of that, I'm just curious about like what, you know, the industry has such a culture in Los Angeles, and I was wondering what like the cultural differences between the two cities are. And then I also would love to hear your take on the future of like, Marvel and the Netflix deal with Disney coming out with their own. Right. Well, I'll go to the second one first because it's an easy question. There is no more Netflix deal. It's over. They're pulling Marvel. They're going to pull everything out and build their own direct-to-consumer product, which is going to be very challenging. But, you know, if anyone can do it, it's Disney, who I have tremendous respect for, and I have tremendous respect for the management. And I know Kevin was here, who's a great executive who works for Kevin Mayer, who I've known for 25 years. So I, I feel like they, I think they have a, a shot of anyone trying to do that. The problem is, for instance, to give an example, Marvel. When they decide how much money they're spending on the budget for that film, it's because they've monetized the film, the Avengers, aggressively around the world to the highest possible bidder. Right, so Sky here pays an enormous amount for the rights to be able to show those films. If, if Sky still has the output deal, I'm not sure. Same thing in in Spain, whoever gets the rights to that, right? And they also did similar deal with Netflix in a second window. So it wasn't the primary window; it was a second window, and then they tried to carve it out whichever way they could. So when you go now and you have to go create that Avengers film, and you're paying for it yourself. There's these pesky people in Los Angeles called agents that basically say, wait a second, are we getting paid what we should be getting paid the highest, or is there some kind of sweetheart deal between the mothership and the studio that's creating the content? And so you will end up having to pay just as much money, if not more, when it's your own platform. Because you have to convince the entire ecosystem of the talent world that it is truly, you are paying, paying getting paid full dollar and they're getting value for what they're doing. And so it becomes, uh, uh, in some ways, even a more expensive content proposition than in the case of Netflix or Apple. They just went out and acquired the content. They just went and bought from a studio or, or an independent production company, or they got a showrunner or whatever. So, so it's going to be very challenging. I think if anyone can do it, it's Disney. But it will not be part of Netflix. It will not, you know. And, and by the way, globally, now that Comcast is buying Sky, it may not be part of Sky deal in the future. Who knows if they have their own open top place? So, so that's the world we're talking about in regards to that. In terms of the cultures, you couldn't pick two more different cultures than Los Angeles and and uh, and uh, London. I I really do love Los Angeles. We still have our house there. We plan to go back. Uh, it's it's a very uh, you know it's it's a very much focused on on a Hollywood like experience you know who you know who where you sit at a restaurant who did you see what you know who was sitting courtside at the Laker game which now is like a big deal right it used to not be a big deal right you know, did you know that this person was sitting courtside uh, where that doesn't really seem to be as much of a culture here. Uh, it's got a very focus on media here uh, in, in LA, less so here. I think I think there's a media element here, but not to the same extent. Uh, and again, it's very insular in LA, where a lot of the discussion or activity is around their particular industry or around what's happening in that market. Where here, what I love is much more global. You know, and they're meeting different people from different parts of the world and so forth. Both are great. Uh, only thing I recommend is try not to live in one for more than 20 years. I lived in one for 20 years. I needed a break. You know, we needed a break, and we needed a, a new environment. It's a long time to live, especially with kids. When kids become part of it, you want to find the right experiences for that. But I think both are great, and uh, and I would not uh, disparage living in Los Angeles at all. Thank you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Alishka. Yes. Slovakia. I was wondering, because you mentioned about disruption and how we don't use DVDs, what is your thing or your next big thing that you see happening in this industry? Because we've already got streaming and it's quite right. easy to be short-sighted. So 
What do you think is that? I'm well, sorry. I wish I could I could see that. I mean, there's a couple <laughs> there's a couple things, a couple trends, things that I'm yeah. really interested in right now that I'm trying to figure out. I mean, clearly, I believe that the Comcast acquisition of Sky will be a game changer in Europe of monumental proportions. Uh, Comcast did not buy Sky because they want to be in the satellite business in the United Kingdom. They, they, they want to use Sky as a platform, it's my, my opinion, I have no inside information, want to use it as a platform to become an over-the-top broadband provider for Europe. I mean, there's a lot of great things here in Europe, but I'll tell you one thing that I've not been blown away in the United Kingdom by, and that's the broadband service. <laughs> and, and broadband is much, much more profitable in the United States than the video business today. Why? Because you have all that content from Netflix on your broadband, right? Guess how much money Comcast pays Netflix for that? Remember the $4 a month I was telling you about? Guess how much Comcast pays Netflix to have Netflix on Comcast broadband? Zero. They don't pay any content costs. And so the broadband business is much, much more profitable. And if people start using it to, for content, that's a good business. And so my sense is that Sky will not only create an over-the-top play, but a very aggressive over-the-top broadband play, pan-Europe. What are the implications of that? What does that mean in terms of content, distribution, who, who, what happens to the various companies that have entrenched, in some cases, governmental monopolies in those particular countries? That's going to be really interesting to try to figure out. I don't exactly know how that's going to play out. What does Google and Amazon and those people do when they see uh, an advantage here, and instead of it being Netflix on the broadband provider that gets the front place, it is Scott. And Netflix, you have to go through four or five different layers to get to the Netflix. So there's a lot of interesting things that could emerge from that. So that's number one. I think that's a real interesting space. Uh, another interesting space is esports. I think. You know, again, I, I can't tell you as you look at younger demographic how much time and energy they spend on not only playing games, but watching other people play games. And so I, I, don't, I don't think people are going to turn on a channel to watch that. But do I believe that there's both a lot more uh, you know, digital, as well as even uh, in-person, live experiences around eSports over the next 10, 15 years? I, I really believe there will be. Uh, I'm not exactly sure what those will be, but I think that's a real big area that I would, would focus on. And, you know, another big trend that I think is, is that's still trying to work itself through is, is on general advertising, right? So the entire industry is really going through an upheaval because traditional advertising uh, is in question in terms of its efficiency, whether it works. There's been this whole drive towards digital. But it's not as if digital's been the holy grail. I mean, there's massive fraud uh, on digital not really clear if you're trying to launch something that it's the right place to do that. And, and you know, you're also highly dependent now on data that the major digital players control and do not share, of which there's clearly in Europe and elsewhere regulatory blowback on that in terms of what, what they're able to do. So that's a space that I think there's going to be a lot of innovation in and a lot of change uh, within the advertising industry itself that I think uh, will change. I mean, example to that is, is I mean, it's the craziest thing in the world, is, is, is the way ad rates are defined on television today is based on sample of 10,000 people, many of which still actually write on a piece of paper physically what they watched, and they write it down, and that's how they decide how much you get paid, how many people wrote down on a piece of paper of those 10,000 people. Uh, or whatever the number is, $10,000. That sounds crazy to me in today's world, right? I mean, Facebook probably already knows that I've been in here and will like, say, oh, stop by this restaurant on your way back, right? But the, the television industry is still doing this. So I, I got to believe there's going to be big changes in that. And you know, there's going to be a big shift. Uh, I'm not entirely sure what that is, but it'd be fun to be, to be in that space to try to figure that out. Uh, my name is Raul. Uh, so my question for you is, uh, you talked about when you were at business school, kind of the two words that you know, got people to jumpstart their career, you know, etc. 
accelerate the career of China in the internet. What would your words of advice be in terms of for us as current business school students, or maybe even potentially for your children? Well, uh, the big lesson I've learned is I can't tell my kids anything because they'll do the opposite. <laughs> I mean, that's the reason I enjoy this is you guys are actually listening to me. My kids would have already been upstairs, you know, like, you know, I got to care. Listen, I, to be honest with you, I think it's more about you being open and listening and trying to hear because you're probably in a better position to know what the future trends are than I will be. You know, I, I'm 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 busy trying to kind of, you know, manage things and, and build your career and make sure your kids get into college and all those things. Where you have the ability now in your life with a fresh view, and plus I'm biased. Like I hear things, you know, and, and you know, I, I did I didn't put money when Google went public. I was like, oh, that price is crazy in smart business school. I was like, oh, that price is crazy. Or that's multiple is not. Realistic, blah 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 blah. They went public, I think, at a what was it, thirty billion, and now they're five hundred billion, right? So, so I didn't have fresh, you know, view or fresh feeling about it. So I, I would, I would suggest to be very open-minded and to listen a lot. And again, don't do what everybody else is doing, right? Like when I, if you wanted, that's fine, right? But when I was graduating business school. Everyone was going into management consulting or investment banking. That's what everybody was doing, every single one. And if you didn't get a job offer from one of those companies, you were like a loser. You were perceived as a loser. You know, Goldman Sachs wouldn't even interview me, right? And so it was like, oh, Goldman Sachs won't even talk to you. And you know, clearly part of that was financial because they were paying a lot more even even then than anybody else. And I'm not so sure that was the right thing to do. You know, now, like, if you love finance, though, like, you know, for instance, a lot of them went into there, and, and one guy from my business school class is Bill Ackerman, who's at good and bad, but, but he went into finance, and, and he's done okay for himself, right? And so, <laughs> so I, think, I think that, uh, you know, you got to decide. But another guy from my business school class, you know, went, of all things, I don't know why he did it, he went to, I think, uh, Merrill Lynch, then he went to Philip Morris, and then he ended up going back to Merrill Lynch, New York Stock Exchange, and now he's the CFO. He just recently became CFO of Uber, uh, Nelson Kahn. So, so there's a lot of different. You just don't know where it could play out. But, but I would be, if somebody says, "Oh, you got to go do this," think twice about it. Think about more what it is you want to do and what kind of culture and who you're working for and those kinds of things, and not so much driven off of what you think is the thing that everybody says you should. Do. Yeah. Hey, uh, Danny Tool, I'm from the UK. Okay, great. Uh, but I'm married to an American. Excellent. Um, <laughs> it's all right, guys. I was going to ask a question around your business and, and Discovery's business so, on the content side and the experience side. So, uh, as you described, the hegemony is all shifting, right? So, what change is that going to bring to the kind of print and press, build in the US, sell everywhere model? Are you going to originate different things in different and how progressed do you think media is in providing really good digital experiences okay. compared so, to other properties? And how fast is that in reality <laughs> going to change for companies that were historically quite conservative yeah. getting into well, this space? Well, a couple of things. I think Discovery, thanks to David Zaslav's leadership, is probably ahead of other media companies, with the exception of, of maybe Disney, who's really trying to pull it up. But, but a couple of things I just say is number one is that. The general strategy of build content once and then export it everywhere is getting incredibly challenged. Not just for Discovery, but for Netflix and others. You know, localization and wanting more local content is becoming more and more relevant, which means you're going to have to spend a lot more money in order to do that. And you've got to have great capabilities and understanding of those local markets. You know, even the digital people, I think their strategy is somewhat flawed. You know, most of the operations of a lot of these companies are built out of the headquarters and not, they don't have really strong local, you know, Amazon's got a great person, I know him, was running it here, Jay Marine, but but they, he came from Seattle, but there's not, like, you know, he still has to go back to Seattle to get a lot of stuff done and to figure out about content and things like that. And I think that's going to have to change across the board in order to be a, more of a global kind of provider of content for discovery for everyone, okay? 
Number two on content is really, is that content relevant in the world that we're talking about in the future? You're, you're programming a cable network for a 24-7 cable network. Is that even relevant anymore? Right. I mean, is it even important? Most, if you know, for our kind of content, 99% of it is on demand. Unless there's some big breakthrough, you gotta go see what we call water cooler. I wanna see it. So when I come to class, everyone knows what's going on and I can talk about it. Most of it's on demand, right? Do you think that will cause a shift? Because it's been a drive over time to get the effective cost per unit down as you distribute it. And that could, if you go on demand, you could say, well, actually, the cost per well, unit needs yeah. to go back up. But the cost per unit's going way up no matter what. Right. I mean, it's, 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 it's crazy. When I left Fox in uh, 2009, we, we uh, launched you know, a pilot. Does everyone know what a pilot is? That's like a new TV series for the Fox channels. And we did distribute chan to other channels as well. We had something like 18 pilots. And the average cost per hour, cost per episode maybe, was about $750,000 across. Today, I think that number is probably about 90, 90 pilots a year. And the cost per episode is probably $3.5 million an episode. Uh, the Crown, everyone seen The Crown here? That's $10 million an episode. Okay, so, so the cost per episode is, is skyrocketing. Number two is, most of content production, which is related to this, is still done, believe it or not, on a sequential basis. That, you know, so like, for instance, she knows when I was running the Nordics, I had this idea of like taking shows, putting them exclusively on the digital platform, and have them full stacking, binging, all on Netflix. So then, okay, so then we're real. We can go to people say, you want to go see the show? You can only go see it on our digital platform, and you get all the episodes. And it was like, whoa, 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 whoa. It's like, we can't do that. Why? Well, we do the shows every week, and we won't be done until the end of the season. I'm like, okay, well, then we're not going to launch it until you're done. I'm like, well, we're supposed to launch now. No, we're not. So we waited like four months before we could launch this one series because we said, you guys got to finish the series. Otherwise, it's not going to matter. That whole, if you go in with that proposition, it's not going to work. Well, there are very few media companies that are set up to do that. Okay? So, so I think that's one of the the challenges in, in that world that I think we're trying to do with. But the biggest challenge, I think, going to your question for media, is that for the most part, with the exception of the film studio businesses, if you had a film studio business, is you're primarily a B2B company. You're not selling your product. Yeah, you look at the ratings. Yeah, you want to see what's interesting. But the number one driver for you as a cable network is whether you renegotiated your affiliate deal with the cable and satellite person, did they pay you like ESPN the $4 and did it go up 10% this, this cycle? Or two, what did the advertisers pay us for this content? It never really mattered. Like, really, the consumers love it. Do they need it? Do they have to have it? it really, you know, in some cases, you got paid a lot of money even if that wasn't the case because of your brand, because of the leverage you had, because of other things that were related to it. At Discovery, I would say probably our most must-have content today in the United States is actually the Food Network. The Food Network is a dominant network, a dominant brand in which for a certain demographic, it is must-have television. It's on all day long. So that's a really strong situation. The other 14, 15, 16 channels we have may not always be in that same position everywhere in the world. So that's a mind shift as a company. Getting people to kind of shift and think out of that is very, very difficult. And so I think that's probably the biggest challenge in regards to that. So that Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Jan from Dominican Republic. Oh, excellent. Far away. It's great. What a, what a diverse group. It's yeah. fantastic. Even Dubai, though. So. Well, that's even more <laughs> Question, uh, you mentioned quickly that uh, you were in private equity as well. If you can tell yeah. us a bit of that, unless if it's a bit of track, otherwise. No, it's fine. It, no, it's not. So, so I didn't actually work at private equity. I worked running a private equity-backed deal. So we bought Miramax, uh, and the private equity firm involved <laughs> was uh, not only Colony Capital, but Qatar Investment Fund. <laughs> And so the one, the one thing there was a great experience. I loved it, you know, and I, I would be very open to do that again. I think the key thing in that situation, though, when you ever you're in in a company that's private equity backed, or you're you're driving it, 
and this would apply to VC a little less so, but venture capital and more on private equity, is to make sure there's alignment into strategically what it is you want that company to become. And like what, whether there's, there's, a, there's a consistency there from the get-go. So if you're joining a, a private equity-backed company and your goal is to invest enormous more capital and to, to, to grow the company on a revenue basis, that may not be what the private equity company really wants. Their private equity company may want, because the capital structure they've created, cash flow, and as much cash flow as possible in order to not only pay down the debt, but to put themselves in a situation where there could be a liquidity event. Because remember, as a private equity investor, you're not a long-term investor. They'd be the first to tell you that they're, usually their funds are anywhere from five to seven years. And I've been involved in other deals on the board where after seven years, they're saying, hey, listen, you've got to find a way to sell this company. We've got to get out. This is like the last company left in our portfolio in this, in this fund, and you've got to get out. And so you've got to make sure there's alignment there in regards to that and that, that that's the, where you want to go. VC is different, where venture capital is about investing in future rounds and growing the business. So that's different, right? Uh, so that, that, I think, is really important. There's alignment. And, and not just financially, but how the strategy affects that. So for instance, in Miramax, one of the big discussions we had often was sh should we be investing a lot more money in new content to then package the existing library and then continue to build the business because a library business can only sustain itself for so long. And I think a lot of the challenges were private equity really wasn't set up. They weren't set up in their heads to start investing a lot more money. They wanted to pull a lot of the cash out of the business. And so that that's just an example. So I think you've got to make sure as you go into that that that's the case. In terms of being in private equity, I think it's a great business. It's incredibly financially lucrative. I think it's going to continue to grow as a capital source because, you know, being a public company is not easy, uh, especially if you're growth equity. It's it's incredibly complicated. I mean, you know, the and, you know the quarterly financials that you have to have these calls and stuff is ridiculous. It's crazy, you know. How I mean, how much different is three four months anyhow? I mean, have things really changed that dramatically? I mean, I I listen to a lot of these calls and they're. I'm like really? I mean, you know, asking the same question over and over and again. It hasn't. I mean, the problem is, if I was a CEO, I'd be like, "You asked that question last time." <laughs> I mean, my my favorite, not to digress, my favorite all time uh, call was I was listening on a Fox call, News Corp call, and somebody started complaining to Rupert about what was going on. Rupert said, "That's fine. Why don't you sell me your stock right now? I'll buy your stock right now." And the guy never asked it another question again. <laughs> So, so, uh, but, so I think private equity will continue to be a very lucrative. I think if you go in that space, there's a couple things you have to understand, is that you, you're not going to be operating the company. You're not, you know, your job is not to operate the company. In fact, the more active you are, the more you will harass the management team and they will not like you, right? So, so you've got you've to be kind of an investor. You're not an operator. And so a lot of it's then what are you interested in and what is you want to do. Two, you know, as of today, there's not a huge amount of, of uh, investment in media and new media and private equity, partially because there's not a lot of cash flow in those businesses being generated. And so you've got to find the right deals and to figure out how to do that. And that three, again, going back to my point, is if you're, most people in life, as you, as you look at business, you're kind of a, a revenue person or a profit person. For the most part, everyone wants profits, don't get me wrong. But do you really like to be involved in things that are high revenue growth, driving, you know, 50, 70 percent revenue growth? Or do you like something that says, hey, you know, we're growing revenue 5 percent a year, but we're making a lot of cash flow, right? If you're more the latter, that's, that's more private equity. If you're really interested in building new businesses, driving revenue, growing, private equity is probably not more your gig. Maybe DC would be more your, if you, if you really want to be the financial side. That's helpful. Thank you. Uh, hi, my name is Daniel, and I'm from London. Um, I'm, uh, I'm just no, curious. Get that. No culture, no diversity. <laughs> sorry, sorry. That's all right. Um, I'm interested in your take on how much steam you think is left in linear TV, um, and whether it's really just tied to the demographics 
Yeah, I and think it's, it's totally it's, tied it's, to and, ev- but, and then eventually, you know. It's going to go away. It is, it is going to go away. Yeah, but, but again, like, it, it's all what your definition of television is, right? Because you can go on a smart TV and get television, right? So it's, so, and it could be a linear live or on-demand experience. I just don't see that <laughs> continuing. I see, I see you know, when, I'm not sure, right? You know, uh, again, always be careful. I mean, like 1996, I was put on this special project at Disney to figure out the future of distribution. We brought out a very high-priced consulting firm, and I was like in charge of trying to do all this analysis. Who's going to win in the future of distribution, telcos or cable? And so all of us spent all this time, and I came back and said, listen, the cable business will be dead in three, four years, easily, because telco has all the advantage. They have ingrained customers. They've got emerging devices, blah, 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 blah. Cable survived a long time since 1996, and it continues to, mm-hmm. to flourish. So, so you know, you got to be careful about when that happens, right? I think some of the things that Linear do, does have going for it, I, I wouldn't call it Linear, I'd call it maybe traditional <coughs> broadcasters, if you want to call it that, uh, especially in Europe, is the fact that they are hyper, hyper local, right? Their brands, their news, their content, and no matter what the big uh, digital players do to try to emulate that, it's very difficult to do it at the scale. You know, we, in our uh, channels in the Nordics, uh, we get 25% market, commercial market share, you know? That's a big audience numbers to, to have. So, so I don't think that's going away. Uh, I also think that those platforms, those, those brands have very strong relationships within the advertising community in those local markets, uh, of which you know, people don't want to just give away everything to digital as a result. Uh, so I, so I, wouldn't, I wouldn't underestimate the potential <coughs> help. I just think there's going to have to be a big change, a shift of how they operate and think given the way they distribute in traditional linear is, is going to go away. As much as my kids don't know what linear television is. Yeah. That's all. They, they don't. Yeah, they, 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 you know. It's, it, it, you know, and, and uh, <coughs> I mean, I think part of it is there's still very robust businesses, both the cable network business and linear broadcast and so forth. And so it's difficult to, one of the biggest challenges in, you know, in, uh, Clayton Christensen's talked about this a number of times. Is the, you know this innovator's dilemma where you, you you have a very strong business that's still sustaining. When do you kill it? When do you decide to go into other things that you know are going to kill your business? The music business knew that the CD as it, as they knew it was over, and that they had to make a shift to something. They didn't know what that model was, and to their credit. They, they helped empower Spotify to be able then to build a business of which an Apple has come in and Amazon's come in and it's sustained it, the business in a major way and they now have growth. But that was a very difficult decision. They, they were on their, they were on like at their deathbed in order to make that decision though. It was not, they didn't make that decision when they were still growing at the CD levels. It was when things were dropping that they had no well, the other bottom, choice. The bottom fell out right. before so, they... So the question is, in traditional media, when I say traditional, I mean television, <clears throat> when, and I think it's starting to, clearly Disney, your question earlier, hey, they're walking away from a lot of money, so it's starting to happen. And so, but, you know, Barry Diller just came out uh, two days ago, and a lot of people listen to what Barry says. I mean, he's probably the most, one of the smartest media people of our generation, he said it's it's game over, it's too late. That's what he said. And I think people woke up and heard that. So yes. yeah. uh, Catherine from Philadelphia. Philadelphia. Yeah. Wow, that's great. Where'd you go to college? Podcast. Yeah, where'd you go to college? I went to UNC. <laughs> great um, school. I went to my first two years at Temple though. Great. My question more is about company culture and what you've experienced over the years. Has yeah. it changed with this shift to digital and what you think is most important to cultivate? You know, it's funny. I, I actually think the biggest cultural change I've seen in media is the way that people manage and operate in businesses. So when I was, has anybody ever read the book Disney Wars? It's a very funny book, but it's about when I was at Disney and how crazy it was. But uh, it was very hierarchical. 
very tough. You know, if you if you you know the things that I was told to do or the things that I saw today would be like a major investigation in the company, right? Like someone would be like, "Oh my God, I can't believe," you know. One time, uh, I was trying to get this presentation done for uh, I was like two years out of business school for a big board meeting at Disney, and and this was really early days of. Uh, PCs and stuff, and I literally, like it was a Saturday, I was getting ready to board meeting, they were all about to take off on the plane, and I lost the presentation. I could not find it anywhere on the computer. I'm like, oh my God, I'm yelling and screaming, where is it? Nowhere to be found. So at the top of my head, I had to try to recreate it with just some old printouts I had, and I was trying to recreate it last minute. I get a call from a senior person who's no longer at Disney like yelling, screaming at me, beyond belief, cursing, where is it, Where? What, what's going on? And he said, if you don't get this on the jet within the next 20 minutes, don't bother coming to the office on Monday. And so it's like out of a movie, right? And so I pulled it all together somehow, ran. This is pre-9-11. I get to the Burbank airport. I take the corporate jet. I stop the corporate jet <laughs> from going off. Thing comes down. I hand him his desk. It's still, you know, Talking to Michael Eisner recently, he brought it up. They still talk about it. And I somehow, I, I got him the deck. So I was like, here you go. And they thought it was the greatest thing they'd ever heard. Today, if somebody did that to someone, you know, there'd probably be a, like a complaint or something about how it is. Because you're not, the way you operate and manage, I think, is much more about, uh, it's less militaristic, less aggressive, more nuanced, more. And so that cultural change has happened. Some. People and companies are doing it better than others. I think Discovery's really good at that, but other companies have really struggled. That, that to me is the biggest culture change I that I, that. I think, yeah. uh, that I've seen in the industry in my twenty-some years is that, you know, things that people did and, 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 and acted a certain way. I also think that there's not, and you know, it's always going to be like this. But again, it goes back to something I said earlier: is that it used to be really considered cool to have like a very big ego and to basically come on in and demand and control and this has to be this way and that and blah, 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 blah. And I think it's like shifting now. It's almost like viewed as a negative if you're that way. And that the, the, the executives that are mostly like or do the best are the ones that have put the ego at the door and kind of act in a more collaborative team way. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, for me in my career, that's had a, you know, because I've had role models early on that were completely different. So I've had to try to adapt the way that I manage uh, and to try to do that. Uh, so that, that's the second way, I think, is, is that you've got to, like, that, the big cultural changes that I've seen in regards to that. Uh, in terms of media and the people, though, it's, it's a big challenge. It's a big challenge. I, you know, how many people in this room, besides, you know, I'm a shocked you're still here, but. How many people are really seriously considering going and working at a traditional media company? <laughs> yeah, that's fine. <laughs> no, I get it. So if I had this at, at Harvard when I was there in 92, 90% of you would have raised your hand. Because there was no non-traditional media company, right? And so let's, I think... Let's see, Mike. Let's, there, it's like a nuance, though. When you say traditional media company, there are digital pockets in traditional media companies. So if you ask that question. I still don't believe in those digital pockets. <laughs> I mean I think they're I think I think they have a shot. Don't get me wrong, I've been involved in a lot of them. Mm -hmm. We believe in them, right? But you know, when I started Hulu, I went and hired a guy from Amazon that knew more about product and tech than anybody else I'd ever met before. And I left them alone. We left them alone. The worst possible thing was a bunch of media people trying to tell all these digital people what they should or should not be doing. And we left them with their own like strategy and agenda. Like I never went to them and said, by the way, can you make sure you guys are promoting this new series on FX? No. It was about building their own business. And so, so I think that that's, again, I, I would personally, if you really want to be in the digital space and you want to be in the technology space, go in the digital technology space. Go and be in that space. Don't go to a company trying to build that out because I don't think it's, I think there's opportunities, but I think they're less so than being in those particular 
I'm just saying this to business school because <laughs> I think that it's something that I would want to hear if I was in your position. Hi, I'm Cecilia from Spain. Well, I actually have a very similar question, but that's different. I was wondering about the difference in culture from different media companies. Yeah. So it's very famous the culture in Google or Apple. Right. Well, I think all of them are changing a bit, right? But, but, you know, Fox. I'll just give you my own experience, right? I think Fox was by far the most entrepreneurial company I've ever worked for in my career. Very much driven uh, by an executive team that empowered people and believed in them and said, "You go do it. If you screwed up, you may not have a job in the future." but really believed in them, and, and also gave them time to do what it is they needed to do. Um, and I can only give one example of that in my career, and that's when I bought MySpace. So when I came up with the idea to buy MySpace, Peter Chernin said to me, great, excellent, we agree, you go ahead and do it. And I'd only been with the company for two months. Never worked with me, didn't know me, you know, knew of me, knew people that knew me, Never worked with me ever, and uh, you know we had this really incredible, like weekend in which we 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 we, we won and we beat Viacom. It was in the same building, trying to get the deal done at the same time. And uh, you know that Friday, I knew it was going to be over the weekend. I said, well, you know, do you want me to call and give you an update or send you an email or anything? Nah, we don't hear from you. We assume everything's fine and the deal will get done. So me and three other people closed the deal. There was like 100 people everywhere else. And we got it done. And they believed in us. And uh, that, that culture is fantastic. It was an incredible culture. I'm not sure how that's going to change or evolve, but it was an amazing culture. And all the credit for that goes to Rupert and his belief in the way that he built that company. Uh, and so that, that's part of culture. Disney, on the other hand, much different culture, less entrepreneurial, but more driven from a kind of a philosophical belief as to what they is, they want to go do, where everyone gets behind it and drives it in a very integrated way. There is no, when they get behind something, it's the reason why Marvel's successful. It's the reason why is the entire company is aligned perfectly to go achieve that. And in many cases, in today's world, you need that because you can't, you can't be so fragmented to compete against all the different choices that consumers have and, and different things going on. So that strategy is really effective for them in that regards. But it's not what I would call entrepreneur. It's not like people are out there doing their own thing or, or allowed to go off there. I think discovery is kind of a good combination of both, You know, where you've got an entrepreneurial culture, very entrepreneurial culture, but also a very integrated across the company to try to work together and integrate. Uh, you know, the, the and, and we're also very active, right? So the other thing, too, is like the discovery culture is driven off of constant, constant change. Uh, and, and so each of the cultures are different. I think the one thing to keep in mind, too, is that in all my examples, is the cultures are usually driven from the top down. So the best way to really identify a culture, understand what it is, is just do a lot of research on who the CEO of the company is and what their background is, what they believe in. What, even the culture of Disney changed dramatically from Michael to Bob. So I, I think that that's you know, part of what I would do is to try to evaluate that. And your team, to Mike's earlier point, definitely speak to the people you're going to work with. It makes yeah. such a big difference. Mike, thank you for sharing your candid insights so eloquently. My name is Rashmi, and I'm an alumni. I'm old enough to remember dialect modems as well. <laughs> uh, so you referred quite a lot to, uh, or alluded to, user-generated content. And of course, there is the whole uh, next way we are seeing around VR, AR. Yeah. Uh, and I have two questions. So the first one is, what are the traditional media or television kind of content companies uh, thinking, how are they thinking about integrating the AR, VR aspect right. where the user is not just creating the content but is also part of the content? Right. That's the one question. The second unrelated question is, as a technologist, uh, clearly when the different areas converge, I was curious to your advice on what advice you would give technologists about better understanding media and content. Right. That's a good question. So on the first question around VR, AR, I, I think there's still a lot of 
skepticism about the future of VR and to whether it's going to have massive adoption. Uh, you know, everyone loves the idea of using VR for, you know, gaming and sports and things like that. But long-term use of the head-mounted device, no matter what you have, there's not really clarity as to yet as to what the impact of that is. And as soon as some kid ends up coming out and saying, you know, my kid's like gone from 2020 to some terrible air, uh, eyesight, no parent in the world's going to let their kids on these head-mounted devices. And so, you know, and I, I know because I built a virtual reality business when I was at Disney where it was uh, these indoor virtual reality theme parks, and we were very nervous about just the use of that. I think AR is a bit different because you clearly don't have that same problem. I think AR is cheaper still and easier to produce the content related to that. Uh, but I still think it, you know, will it be real? I think one of the things that I think you're going to see AR a lot more, uh, more and more is on the advertising side as, you know, as a meaningful way to, to drive eyeballs. And, you know, it's like you're sitting in a, in a, in a tube and something AR comes out at you and the advertiser is going to get your get your attention than just a billboard, for instance. So I, I think that that's an interesting area that I would, I would focus on. But VR is still, still skeptical about in regards to where that could be. In terms of technology companies, I mean, it's pretty, pretty simple. For all the issues that we talked about previously about media companies, if I was in a room of, of, uh, of a tech company and asked how many people here have a content experience, very few would raise their hand. So it's like this weird kind of thing where, you know, they're driven off of scale and investment and the ability to kind of like use consumer data, but they don't maybe in some cases understand content. They have a huge advantage right now though because of capital that it doesn't really matter. They can spend so much money on content that they're able to break through because the content business is a bit like a portfolio business, you, you don't know what's going to work. I mean, no one knows really what's going to work. You got to spend enough and do enough to make sure something breaks through. So, I don't. I I, I think that they're definitely at a disadvantage. I think the other disadvantage is, is again localization, as I said earlier. You know, it's not typically in a tech. You know, they launch and they're global. Uh, where I do think having expertise on content, ad sales, distribution on the ground is really important. Marketing is important. So those would be the areas that one. Uh, so going back to when you're saying when these new technologies are threatening traditional models, companies really don't want to kill their their uh, the models that are grandfathered in. So then, how did you create Hulu and go to these companies and say, "Hey, this is going to completely mess right. with what you're saying. Well, you know, first of all. I I was part of a whole group that created, including Peter Chernin and, and David Zasloff, who was at NBC at the time, and then, and then Bob Iger at Disney. So I was just a small part of that in terms of making that happen. But, but I think it goes back to, like, I think we, we came to three, three points. One, the only way to compete against digital on a broad base, the digital players, is through aggregation of content. You can't go and say, okay, you're going to go to this one channel and get this show. You need to go to one place and get it all. Otherwise, you're, you're kidding yourself to think you can compete against a Google or Netflix, especially today, right? The only way you can aggregate, because you're a studio, is by partnering with somebody else. So that was number one, is the power of aggregation. Two was that you cannot use it as a, as a, a means to an end. There can be no ambiguity. Uh, that well somehow we're doing this but it's going to also help our, our, our traditional media business. It cannot at all. It has to be solely driven off of digital. You have to be able to make the decision. We're pulling stuff off of television and we're putting it exclusively on digital. Or we're going to do content that only lives on the digital platform. So that's number two. And then number three was, and we got everyone bought it, bought it on that. And number three, and probably most importantly, is we said we don't want anyone from the existing media company to probably go and work at that company. Maybe a few people on the ad sales here and there, but we hired an executive who went and hired an entirely new team on his own to do that. Uh, and, and we trusted him. So I'll like, uh, just give a quick story on this. And so uh, we hired you know, 
probably the strongest product tech executive I've ever met in my life, Jason Kyler, to be the CEO of Hulu. And he was joining, uh, it was in July, he was joining on a Monday, and he got a call from the former CTO of NBC Universal on a Friday saying, hey, listen, uh, and, and this company I don't even think is around anymore. It's a company called Razorfish. I don't know if you guys ever heard of that company. Uh, look, we got a green light Razorfish because they're building the new platform and everything for the, for the business. And so you got to green light them. And we got a you know, green light, I think it was like $8 million or something like that. And I was at Starbucks in Manhattan Beach. I remember this day because I was looking out at the ocean. I was like, well, listen, it's Friday, you know, Jason starting Monday. Should we at least wait till Monday and see what he has to say? Well, well we can't. I said, well, why not? He goes, well, because we want this launched by September because that's when we launch all our new series and we want to use it as a way to promote all of our new series on the platform. I said, well, listen, that's a separate question. Whether he's going to be ready by September, I don't know. I said, we got to wait till Monday. He goes, well, it could be a problem. I think they're, you know, we could be upset. I'm like, listen, if there's a problem, you know, just blame it on me, but I think we wait till Monday. So at 10 o'clock, Monday morning, Jason Kyler calls me. He's kicked Razorfish out of the building. He's never gonna use a third party to build the technology platform. He wants to go hire his own team. He's got this guy from Microsoft, this other guy from, uh, from Google that he wants to steal to go build the business. And, and by the way, he wants to go acquire this company in China that he thinks is low cost development that could go build the site. And he's heard this scuttlebutt about September the earliest that he will be ready to launch is April the following year. So that was an even more interesting conversation I had to have on Monday, right? Now, we, not me, but Peter Chernin, Jeff Zucker, David Zaslav, people like that, had the confidence to say, okay, fine, we're gonna listen to what he's saying. Let's go do it, he knows what he's talking about. That takes a lot of confidence. It takes a lot of confidence, a lot of courage for those executives to do that. And so that, that to me, that ability to hire the right people and let them go do what they have to do, I think is the only way, the only way that these traditional media can evolve and compete in the long term. Uh, hi, Mike, my name is Sunil. Yeah. I'm, uh, met outside. We met outside, hey. Uh, we, I'm one of the alumni, and uh, I'm based in London. Uh, so thanks for sharing your background because some of that actually relates to my previous background also, although I'm you know, quite far away from where you are right now. Um, uh, doing a startup before, actually when I was a student, I started the company here, which was funded by a lot of alumni and faculty. Right. Uh, but then you mentioned a thing about knowing when to exit the right time. Yep. And uh, with the help of others, we were courageous enough to exit out of it at that right time, and actually we teach about it at school also in one of the courses. But then, um, now we are running another business for over three years, which is in video streaming space, essentially in um, YouTube and Facebook video distribution. Right. So, we have done a lot of, we work with a lot of music stuff, but we have recently started with working with a lot of film and TV content, especially from Middle East and Asia. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think I mentioned to you outside that I'm talking to someone in Discovery mm -hmm. New York, um, in, uh, uh, who's the digital head there. So, looking at your extensive Who background, I'm sorry? Who in Discovery New York? Matt, uh, okay, his surname is uh, Bonacorso. Matt Bonacorso, a digital product director, uh, okay. digital director of digital products and e commerce. So, um, my question to you now is because we are really very new to film and TV, although we're working with some clients already, but you have already told me so many things, I feel like I know nothing <laughs> about that space. Um, what do you think Discovery UK, for example, is doing in terms of YouTube distribution, Facebook distribution, yeah. or Fox has done before? No, we've done a lot. Or, I mean, so all the media companies have done a lot through, uh, in fact, some have invested an enormous amount of money into it. We, we bought a company, Now This News, or it's now called Group Nine, mm -hmm. that includes Now This News, the Dodo, Thrillist, that are all social video platforms. Also invest in a company called VIX, which is the largest Latin America uh, digital social video platform. Uh, we have an investment in a company called Little Dot here in the UK, that's the largest uh, YouTube uh, channel management company. 
And then, you know, Disney uh, bought Maker. Uh, Time, AT&T just bought Otter Media, which Peter Chernin started, which included uh, full screen. So there's an enormous amount of activity in the social video space. Uh, and I think everyone, uh, you know, just yesterday, TasteMate just got an investment from Amazon. So, so there's an enormous amount of still focus on this space and trying to understand how to build a business on the backs of Facebook and YouTube primarily. I mean, because Twitter is video, I know they're in video, but really the action is all around Facebook, Facebook, Instagram, and, and, uh, and YouTube. And the jury's still out on it. You know, Vivo is the greatest example. Vivo was a joint venture created by the music industry where they dominated and had all exclusive controls on YouTube of the video product and still couldn't really make a meaningful business out of it. It's very, very tough monetizing the content on those platforms. It's very difficult because you don't own the customer per se. You're, you're hold on them. And then, you know, they do one little quirky thing with the algorithm and suddenly you went from number one to number 20 overnight. And so you've got, you've got it. It's a very, very challenging business. I still believe it's got big potential. Why? Because you've got a lot of audience that likes your content. That's a good position to be in. I'm not crazy about being a third party distributor on their platform of other people's content. I'm not so sure that's a meaningful space because at the end of the day, it, you know, if YouTube, Facebook, Amazon see that that content's working, somebody smart there says, you know what, why don't we just go get the content ourselves? Why do we need this third party in the middle doing that for us, right? And so I think the way to compete on those platforms is to create and, and have compelling content that you own control. E even, I mean, I'll just tell a funny story, like these, uh, even these deals with what I would call like YouTube influencers, like people, third parties, right? So this one time in my former life consulting business, I was brought in by a major media company to look at that space. And I was met with 20 of these companies all day, like all these different YouTube companies that had influencers and deals and stuff like that. After a while, I couldn't even tell you which one was the other. It was so confusing. <laughs> and one of them comes to me and says, in the com well, we have this woman who was very popular at the time. I think her name was Michelle Fan or something like that. She was mm -hmm. like a fashion expert, right? She's with us. She's exclusive to us. She's, she's with us 100% and, and long term, right? Two hours later, Michelle shows up with her agent and another company and says, no, I'm with this company. And so they're just, they're, they're, if you don't own it, if you're not creating it, and you don't have that relationship directly, you're kind of an aggregator on those platforms, that's a tough place to play. But if you have some compelling content, like Now This News, like Tastemate, like this company Vix, that you can provide and you own it, although the monetization still challenges instinctively, I think that's an area that's gonna still be meaningful because you have content that they care about. But you say content, and you mentioned Vivo, that of course Sony and Universal did together, and you already mentioned that it didn't work out quite well. But we have just recently started working with Sony uh, in New York, and we can see what didn't work out <clears throat> in a lot of areas. And of course, you're saying one thing is content, so we are not the ones who do content. So what I want to understand is, is, this, is the success in this space really just about having the best content, or it can be something on top of in terms of technology, in terms of claiming and copyright issues and how you can algorithmically well, you know, sort those things out? Well, I mean, there's a lot of companies that have solved that, right? I mean, the, the algorithmic uh, you know, businesses, like uh, there's an enormous amount of companies that have focused on that. Zephyrs, for example, a you know, major leader in that. Uh, I think you need it all. Like people, people ask, like, to be successful as a digital company, what do you need? Is it the content? Is it the marketing of your platform? Because you still got to get people to find you. And is it the product and, and, and the user experience? All the above. You, you can't, you, there's, no, there's no place that you can, I mean, again, the, the, the stakes are just way too high now. This isn't like me when I started Z.com in 2000, where just the fact that the thing worked, you're like, hey, that's a really interesting company. I like that company. Right? It is game over. You know, the stakes, the amount of money, put aside the major 
Facebook, Google, Amazons of the world, the amount of venture capital money that's being spent in the valley for companies that have all these ideas, it, 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 the only way you'll break through is if you dominate in all three of those areas. Now, it doesn't have to be on a broad base. It could be narrowly cast. It could be driven on a geographic basis where you're the dominant player in that geography, but you got to be good in all three. And if you're not, you're kidding yourself that you will ever have a company that's going to be able to win. And, and I would argue even of, of anything that the product tech piece is, is even more important than it ever was, right? That you have, you know, when we, when we launched Hulu, everyone said, oh, that's breakthrough. That's like table stakes now. You know, the future, in fact, there hasn't been a lot of, when you think about it, there's not been a lot of development on the user experience. Most of it happening within Netflix and others in terms of what they're doing on UI. I think there's going to be a whole new area. Maybe that's augmented reality. Maybe that's, you know, voice recognition, a la Alexa, or whatever else. I mean, there's going to be a lot of development there. And again, no offense to the big companies. I think they're great. But anyone here watched the US Open on Amazon? I wouldn't suggest that was like cutting edge user experience. So it's not like the, 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 it's game over there. There's a lot to play there. But I think you got to be great at all. You can't. You want to say? Uh, sorry. Hi, I'm Bonnie from Canada. So to be successful. We're in Canada. Toronto. Oh, that's great. <laughs> uh, to be successful in media, you have to take a lot. That's like me saying I'm from the United States. You gotta tell me where this is. I know, but Americans do. Yeah, that. go ahead. <laughs> um, what's the biggest mistake you've made in your career, and how did you recover from that? Oh my God! <laughs> you knew that was coming. We only got like five more minutes. That's like the craziest question ever. <laughs> I've made so many mistakes. Uh, it's part of the problem when you get older. You realize all the mistakes you make, right? A uh, couple things just very quickly. Okay? And it, it's, it's a little repetitive, I apologize. But I had a chance to go uh, up to the valley and work for a uh, digital company. Uh, and I didn't do it because I said, number one, I was like, well, do we really want to move from LA? We like it here, things are good, but we didn't even have kids. And two was, uh, uh, I was worried because they wouldn't give me a title. And I was going in in a position I had no idea what the job would be. Probably if I took that job, I wouldn't be sitting here right now. I would have probably be retired by now. <laughs> and so, so don't get caught up in that stuff. It's not worth it. I mean, go, go and do, you know, if it sounds like it's a good company and a good opportunity, be willing to move, be willing to take the risk, and, and you'll prove yourself because all you guys are incredibly talented. To be at the school, you have to be talented to get in here. So I know you're all talented. I'm not just saying that to be nice. I know how talented she is. So, so you, will, you will be able to make it in those companies. You don't have to worry about, well, you know, where is it going to go? Be careful who you're going to work for and that stuff, but... That's number one. So I I made a lot of mistakes on that. Number two is I probably if you know there's times where things are going really good where I've taken myself too seriously and believed you know everything was great and and you know things in, in life are very uh, can change and a lot of times out of your control they may be things that are within the company or changes from a macro standpoint or whatever like so don't don't ever get so complacent to think that. Things are so great, they're always going to work out at that particular company. And I think the, the third biggest lesson that I would say to people, which has really been probably the most important thing I've done in my career, is don't get so focused on that company that you don't network and build relationships outside of the company. So when I was, uh, when my internet company was went under, I was really struggling trying to find a job. It was uh, you know, post 9-11 in the United States, and it was like almost impossible to find a job. And out of the blue, this guy calls me up, and he says, I want to be your career coach. I'm like, this guy's crazy. He wants to be my career coach. I can't get a job. What is this guy? He must be desperate. He goes, no, I really like you. I know enough about you. I, I believe in you. He's still my coach, you know, some 18 years later. And so we spent a lot of time together, and I'm going to give you free advice. And he said, your biggest problem is you spend all your time worried about what people at Disney think about you or what people at your company thought about you. And you're not networking out and meeting other people and building relationships and doing it in a way that not for some benefit. It may not lead to anything, but kind of like 
Kevin Bacon, six degrees of separation, kind of, you know, that person talks to somebody else and that leads to something else and things like that. And he, I said, he said, well, how much of your day do you spend networking? I said, well, probably like maybe 1%. He said, 25% of your week should be doing that. And so it changed my life, it changed my career, not my life, but changed my career. I literally then started going to lunches and going out and grabbing a drink or having breakfast. She knows I'm the queen of breakfast, <laughs> kings of breakfast. I always go to have breakfast with someone. And, and uh, not personal level, I mean, not, you know, most of my relationships personally are my, my friends, not professional friends, are mostly personal. I'm talking more for a professional basis, going out and <coughs> building relationships and talking to people and networking and doing little things for them, you know, like, if you have a conversation, I'll give you an example. I had a conversation with this uh, this this person I know. I just met her, a very accomplished executive, and I said, "Well, do you know this person who's a big recruiter in the sports space? Because she, she wants to be in sports." She goes, "No, I don't. I just met her. I connected her. She was incredibly thankful. You know, who knows where that could lead down the future? But those kinds of things are." Much more so. Focus on those relationships. Focus on the networking, and don't don't because when you go out of here, you're going to be so maniacally focused on your job and trying to prove yourself to your boss that you kind of forget that other stuff, and you're probably not going to be at the same company your entire career. So building those relationships and stuff is important. So that would be my advice. I, I think we're. we're out. All right. Well, thank you. you guys have been incredibly patient. I don't know. Listen, wish you the best of luck. It's a great place, enjoy business school, I wish I could go back, you know, you have those dreams in your life where you go back in time, you know, and you'll remember this time, it's a great experience in your life, and, and uh, I wish you all the best of luck and, in your endeavors and like, in the future. Thanks a lot for doing this. Oh, that's great. Thank I, you very I much. I don't need to tell you guys how busy he is. So. No. <laughs> Thank you very much.